right, so we're in go to. Hey. Marcus. Hey, Charles. How you doing, man? I'm good. It's been a w way too long since I've seen you. Last time was Chicago. That's true. And since then, I've been traveling Europe to teach. Excellent. Haskell, I assume? Haskell, C Sharp, Link. Excellent. And of course, Gilad Braca joins us. Sort of a surprise. We weren't expecting you here. No one ever expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> but Gilad, yeah, what, what are you doing in Aarhus? Uh, well, and in you're... Aarhus, uh, I, I visit Aarhus rather frequently these days because uh, this is Dart Supreme headquarters. Uh, and so I'm, I'm here. Uh, this is since June, the third time I've been here. So, yeah, uh, basically uh, the, a, a large part of our group is here. Uh, Lars is here, so that's why... I the real, real decisions happen here, and those of us who want to have some small bit of influence <laughs> need to come to the headquarters. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So listen, you guys, since we have two language designers sitting in front, I've been thinking recently about, you know, what's the state of programming language design? Is the art and craft of programming language design dead? We don't seem to see anything really new. Now. You may say that Dart it represents something very new, and it, yes, it does, but there still seems to be this rehashing of the same concepts over and over and over again. Where's mm -hmm. the next generation? Well, well Charles, I, I, you know, there's two kind of, you know, older, bold guys sitting here, you know, talking about language <laughs> design, so, but we're not dead, you know, we're still kind of full of life. Yeah. So, uh, um, so I don't think the programming language design is dead. Um, if, if I would phrase it like this, is that, Programming has certain fundamental abstractions, so that's what you the, that you see kind of you know constantly reappearing, and you're trying to combine them in different ways. It's just like when you're cooking; there are certain ingredients, and you're trying to create the perfect meal by you know carefully combining these ingredients. Um, and I would say that Dart is actually taking some rather revolutionary ideas, according to the programming language community. Um, with respect to its type system, wouldn't you say that you know your revolutionary? I mean, well, these well, ideas uh, have been around for decades, yes. but yes, uh, they're um, they're ideas that have not hit the mainstream in any way yet. So there's a lot of stuff that is only hitting the mainstream that is decades old. Uh, you know, actors are a fairly re have been become hot and widely known only in the past few years. It's an idea that really dates to 1972 when people were programming with flint tools. And so it takes a long time. Uh, the limitation here isn't the technology, the limitation is the people. And people have a deep attachment to how they program. It's a cultural artifact in a way like natural language. And people hate to change it. And so it moves as fast as the people will let it, which is very, very slowly. So the, the core ideas, yeah, they've all been around for a long time. I don't think there are new core ideas, really. But a lot of those ideas were very good, but not, uh, didn't catch on for all kinds of reasons. And eventually, you know, good will triumph. So, so that's an interesting thing. Like some people say you should not listen to the hit parade, you know, now. You should wait, you know, 10 years, you know, and then listen to the golden oldies when, you know, the mm -hmm. good songs, you know, like have shifted like the cream on the milk. Yeah. Um, do you believe that there's something like that for ideas in programming language as well, that you cannot judge right now when somebody comes up with a new idea whether it's really a good idea? Well, you first of wait? all, I can certainly judge right now. Yes, I so could always you, judge, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But uh, <laughs> I think the really good ideas, they've been around so long that you can judge. You can look back yes, a long yeah. time, but you need judgment, which is in short supply. Uh, and. To some extent, uh, yeah, I don't think that, it, that you want to wait 10 years. Uh, the whole advantage is from taking good stuff. You have to make the judgment if it's really ready for prime time in your context. Are the implementations mature enough? Or can, is, is the whole ecosystem there? Do you need that much of an ecosystem? You know, everybody has their own considerations, right? There are legitimate reasons for, for businesses and stuff to be a little conservative. They're usually far too conservative because they usually can't find qualified people who, to make those decisions. And if they do have them, they have, they're outnumbered by unqualified people who will override them. So, I, but I don't think that you want to, you know, it's not like when a new car comes out, you want to wait for two model years to be sure they debug it. None of these cars are really new. They're really just reshuffled. 
And, and so let's kind of go back to an idea that you mentioned, an old idea of actors. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think it took so long for that idea to blossom and why is it now so hot? Uh, well, partly because the need for it, the, the need for really l massive amounts of, of independent uh, you know, actors concurrent through Threads is an overloaded world, but threads of, of, of control uh, has become more and more pronounced. There's more. We've reached a point where it's harder to make the, the hardware run faster, so we finally started to focus on, on more units of, of, of hardware and things like that, and we'll see more and more of that. So this is a vision both for hardware and, you know, the vision was driven by Carl Hewitt's insight into really fundamental things, but very few people get that sort of thing. It's really, you know, you have to hold, you know, a knife to their throat and say, the world is changing, you'd better get with the program. And so uh, I think that one was exceptionally far-sighted and consequently uh, takes even longer to, to catch on. But I, I don't think it's different from other ideas. It just, you have to have the right constellation. Basically, you have to reach a point where people don't have another choice. Because if they mm -hmm. have a choice, they won't change. They just, change is painful. People don't like that. Yeah, by the way, there's a great interview with Carl Hewitt on Channel 9 that we did a while back. So mm, if you want yeah. to really kind of you know, hear from the inventor of actors himself, you know, what actors are, you know, you can go there. So does Dart have any kind of special support for actors? Like they, you have this isolates, right? Right. Are, so, are they kind of so influenced isolates by isolates are, are very much influenced by actors. Uh, they're, uh, you know, uh, independent threads of control with separate heaps and stacks and such so so in, and they communicate via message passing so in some sense the essence of actors is there now details you know vary but uh we, do, we don't have any multi-threading in the sense of shared state concurrency so so we're actually surprisingly pure there uh, not necessarily because you know i may be a purist but the project as a whole is very much not so but uh we are constrained by the platform we're targeting, which really doesn't have the means of, of doing anything else very well. So, so yeah, it's very, very actor-like in, in, in that respect. And, and so one, one of the things that, like, you know, a lot of people say when they talk about concurrency is they, want, they talk about immutability. But I think with actors, they are, as you said, right, they have their own stack. So they are mutable, but, but the changes are isolated. So... They right. are they are locally mutable. Right. And this is not a the pure actor model mm -hmm. in the sense of, of all these things being functional. These are basically conventional single threaded programs that communicate via message passing. And that's that's what you that's actually the the form that you've largely seen take off in, in, in many places. Uh, which uh, which is fine, which does mean that in some sense, there is state somewhere in the yeah. model and, and so forth, and, and no doubt you can, it can get you, but much less than, than in a shared state, you know, closely coupled, multi-threaded uh, sense. And, and so one of the things that, you know, if you look in the Dart, um, inside the kind of implementation of the Dart VM, you, you have this trick where you kind of, you know, in order to speed up loading of programs where you can kind of, you know, do like a core dump and then read back the... The uh, snapshot. The snapshot, stuff. yes. Um, right. Can you, can you um, enlighten us a little bit about that? Is, is that? That's also like an old idea. If you look at LaTeX, you know, Tech does the same thing. It's like a primitive form of jitting in some sense. Or well, the snapshotting is really yeah. a, or if you go talk. back, small talk, right? So this is, this is sort of a lobotomized small talk <laughs> image, very lobotomized. Yes. It's, it's much more restrictive and much more narrowly focused than, than, than a small talk image, which really captures all your yes. state yeah. and, and so forth. But the, the idea is the same, that you can bring back these things if you, you know, very fast if you, if you save them as a unit, as opposed to, say, serializing something and then chasing graphs and, and things like that. And startup time is a big problem on the web and growing bigger uh, as, as more ambitious projects get on the web and at the same time the web gets on less ambitious machinery like phones. Uh, those two trends do not do well in terms of startup time. And so this is a technique that can be used to, you know, if not, it has other advantages, but right now that's really the, the point of it. And of course, to this this works with a Dart VM, 
And so, uh, you know, there's, there's more limited scope where we can, where we can rely on this, but it, it is a technique. It's a technique that should have been used for this purpose many years ago, uh, you know, in, in the Java TM world, uh, right? Startup is a notorious problem, and you would think that this idea would have occurred to someone and someone might have brought it up and something might be done about it and uh, except for something being done about it you might be right but bottom line is uh, you have to act on it you have to engineer it and we're in the process of doing that but, but the, the idea is that you can get things can start up a lot faster especially on the web you have this problem that people expect to, to serve basically source code yeah, yeah. so you have the extra overhead of parsing this stuff right there's no really good um, intermediate form and so the snapshot kind of takes that role but i always wondered i mean i really like you know that should be obvious that i like this idea but it always puzzles me why do we kind of separate the code and the state of a running program and then now we have to kind of as you say serialize it and why don't we just treat, you know, a program, a running program as one unit that, you know, you save and then, you know, you restart or even to distribute your code. Um, and so why do the, I ever have to write something that writes data to a file and reads it back? Why can't we just persist okay, the, the you binary got, now image? You're gonna, now, I, this, I know you said this deliberately because you want to get me started. <laughs> and uh, so, so this is, this is A, it's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, Smalltalk has been doing this for some decades now. Yeah, but, and don't they say that you can take a Smalltalk image from 20 years ago and just yeah, push the button and run it? Probably, yeah. You can, take a, you, can take a small, you can take a Newspeak image running on Windows with certain native Windows windows open and take it to a Mac and open and have those windows reopen yeah. with the same contents, with the debugger open at the same time. Yeah, it, it has something to recommend it. Uh, on the other hand, and it starts up Mm -hmm. pretty damn fast and so forth. So, so there's a lot of good things about this. Uh, there are downsides because, uh, especially when you're developing, right, your state can, can go wrong, can get corrupted, and having your program and state kind of intermingled in this way makes it very hard to tease them apart. So one of the, the, the reasons, I mean, the reasons are debated to death as to why Smalltalk did not take over the world as it should have, uh, is that deployment was, was sort of a, a bit of a complicated story here because in fact the typical small talk development process you have this wonderful development environment and this IDE travels with your application with your state etc everywhere and separating them is, is difficult which is why you know it can be done differently you need your language has to have a, a, a very clean notion that separates program from state right it has to be modular in, in a way that you can actually understand what your program is independent of the state and then you then it's very easy to to separate that's what we do in Newspeak for example but as a development tool it has pros and cons and there are intermediate versions of this that you know small talks that didn't use a pure image like strong talk uh, but it's not you know all you need is is for your program to during development to to screw up your image once and 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 go through the effort of uh, recovering from that to realize that well there's something to be said for the stupid old files and which which completely keep the two separate. So ideally, you want to combine the advantages. Yes, yeah, but but even <coughs> when you know we, we all have had like you know our mail reader doesn't open because yeah. you know your your your, your mail file is yeah. corrupt or something yeah. like. So it, is that really kind of tied to the fact that you have like code and data together or? Well, I think yeah. it makes it a lot Not worse, worse, right? Okay. Obviously, your program, your actual application, will run on some data, and I'm of the view that they should be viewed. A program should be viewed as data. It should be separable. It shouldn't have. It shouldn't depend on data, but it should be viewed as data, so that you can synchronize programs the same way you synchronize your address book. I've said this on Channel Nine before, right? You just want to have this. You, the same mechanism could serve as your update mechanism, and you know, it, it works very nicely. Once you have that kind of model, all kinds of things, reflection, etc., everything works out better because it's, by design, the program is easier to manipulate. It's, it's designed to work as, as data. Uh, so we should move in that direction, and eventually we will. It's just uh, another one of those things that takes decades, and any, any imperfect realization has flaws that, you know, you can argue against. Mm -hmm. Certainly, small talk images are far from perfect and, and, and a mixed blessing in a way. 
and and so so you you, you we, we talked about f before about your ideas of you know like components for the web and so on and yeah. um, one thing that i would like to kind of you know talk a little bit about now is like schema versioning a lot of people that seems to be a like a hard problem that a lot of developers run into um, now sometimes I, I say, well, if you don't have a schema in the first place, if you have a dynamically typed yeah. language, then that problem is, you know, it might still exist, but it's a lot less in your face because you don't have to change the types. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is your opinion about, or how do you deal with like schema changes and versioning? Well, I think that it is a very hard problem. And again, work has been done for this on decades. Yes. Probably the yeah. Lispers have done the most work on it, right? It is hard. Uh, types only make it harder, like, yeah. well, just true of many things. <laughs> and you, you end up, uh, in the end, there is a schema even if there is no type. And so yes. you yeah. add things, you remove things, and you need to have, someone has to, to specify how these things, you migrate from one one version of the schema to another. And there have been schemes where you can annotate things and say, okay, here's how I map from version so-and-so. And the problem is that these changes themselves may have side effects or rely on the old schema or the new. So it, it, it gets rather tricky. I, th I think that just more attention should be paid to it because uh, what we do in practice are convoluted workarounds of all kinds that st still still hit people in the face. and. Nobody's willing to, to invest the effort to do it right. And if you try to do it right without really going all the way, you're going to fall on your face. So I, th I think there needs to be more research on this, more projects that try to do it right, that actually address the issue of how, how data migrates. Um, now that we have large bodies of data, your data is often out in the cloud somewhere. In a way, that's sort of easier because there, there is some some authority or server or whatever who, who can deal mm -hmm. with this and has the resources and time and, and obligation to, to upgrade your data, right? You basically want to, your program and data to upgrade. You don't want to find old dusty decks somewhere from years ago, right? And now we're in a connected world, so it's really a question of immediately upgrading everything rather than worrying about money layers, so that can help. And so to kind of tie it back to, to Dart, so one of the things that I like about Go is the way they, the, the notion of interfaces in Go. Mm -hmm. um, now Dart um, has no interfaces anymore, I, I, I learned. Well, um, the, so, uh, so okay. what's the deal there? Explain. Okay, yeah. so the concept of interface is still very important in Dart. For example, classes can implement other things, which what, what you don't have anymore is a syntactic concept of an interface, a declaration that's okay. called an interface, because we found it was redundant. Uh, one of the things that we, we've done right is, in Dart, the, the type system, optional though it is, is completely interface-based, right? It only matters what interface, you, you know, an object uh, implements. It doesn't matter what co particular class it was. There's no way for you to, to describe a type and say that this ties you to a particular implementation, except for a few places like numbers and booleans where, okay. where we're, because we're more concerned with being efficient and it's very, very rare that anyone needs to override them. So given that, we then realized that, well, okay, now you can actually implement another class, which means you won't extend it, you won't inherit its representation or its implementation, but we'll say that you conform to that type, as it okay. were. And once you have that, you realize that uh, you, know, you can replace interfaces with abstract classes. And in fact, this solved a whole slew of ugly problems like what, uh, what are the values of default parameters in an interface declaration, or where do we put static methods in an interface declaration, all kinds of, of, of things like that. So we got rid of the declarations, but you still have this notion of an interface because that's really what you're programming to. And in fact, you can implement another class so there's still an implements clause on classes, even though there isn't an interface declaration. And this, this has simplified a lot of stuff. It works very nicely. This is probably the, one of the best things that has happened to Dart in the past few months. And, and does, doesn't that introduce problems with multiple inheritance? Because now doesn't your class have now multiple super types? Or it, it has changed absolutely uh, nothing, nothing okay. because it, the problem with, with multiple inheritance is multiple implementation Station, inheritance, okay, yes. right? Multiple classification, which is what interfaces give you, is not a problem uh, because you don't have to uh, 
resolve, you know, you don't have to choose between one thing or another. And so it, it, they behave exactly as multiple, in, you know, implementing multiple interfaces do in, in, a, in all the languages that uh, people are used to. So it, it really didn't complicate that at all. And do you then have something like traits where you can inherit implementation but not types? Uh, well, we have, right now we have just vanilla single inheritance. We're very conservative. Uh, we are going to have mix-ins. Details to be nailed down. I mean, there is a proposal and all, but you know, until it's, you know, at, at some point we're actually, uh, we're we're aiming for uh, what we call M1, which is an unspecified uh, thing at an unspecified time because we don't like to make commitments. But it it basically is uh, is a, a version where we're saying pretty much the language will not have breaking changes anymore, and. After that, we may add things, and mix-ins are expected to be an addition that will not okay. break existing stuff. And, and so it's, it's out there, but not for immediate use. Charles. I have a question. Okay. So that's actually an interesting point. As language designers, when do you know it's time to stop breaking changes? I mean, don't you have to wait for there to be relatively substantial amount of use in the real world under various scenarios you might not have thought about? Well, uh, A, we don't know. Uh, the real world doesn't operate that way. If, if, you, if you waited to, to do things until you knew, you know, we, there, are, there, are, there were creatures who took that approach. They're endangered in the rainforest in, in Uganda, the chimpanzees and the mountain gorillas, because they, they took the conservative approach and stayed where they were. So you have to take a bit of a risk, but, you know, we, we're, again, Dart is not a radical language. We are not... Uh, testing out new con concepts on people, for the most part. And so we, we, we have a fair idea of what's likely to work, and we've built a fair amount of code ourselves. And so we're, you know, and again, we, um, there's no death penalty if we're wrong. So, you know, if, if somehow we screwed up and there might be some adjustments, they'll come very early, but by and large, we, we have a sense that things are, are as, you know, in pretty good shape, and again, these are, concepts that are mostly known from, from a bunch of languages and you know they're just put together in a nice way that'll work on the web. So one before I, I want to also talk about the kind of control flow aspects of Dart but one one more question about the type system so when you have this you know like optional typing system do you have any concept of downcast and what does that mean and how do you kind of check type compatibility when you're doing a cast? Right, so in fact, uh, and with some reluctance, there is now a, a cast operator called as. And oh, that sounds familiar. Do you, yeah. Where did you get that syntax from? Uh, I don't know uh, <laughs> why. I can't imagine where, where no comment. Uh, so the, the idea is basically, you know, it wasn't essential you could you could do the, we had a, a, a equivalent of an instance of test, which was mm. called is. And that really, you can ask where we got that <laughs> one from. But you could, you could express what you wanted before. This just is, is sort of a convenient shorthand mm. for that. Uh, and it's a dynamic test. Now, what is, is it that is being tested here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we have a number of relations defined in, in the type system. And there is uh, assignable, if you will, which is a very loose relationship. And there's subtype, which is a slightly tighter relationship, which is still pretty loose by most people's standards, right? And, uh, and subtype is what we test. So, you know, more or less what you'd expect. There's a nominal declaration relationship between the classes. And when you get to generics, we have our famous patented covariant uh, scheme. No, it isn't patented actually. <laughs> oh, just just in case you it's were unsafe. Worried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but very useful. Yeah, and uh, and so you basically do that that comparison at runtime. Uh, now, again, it's not a sound system, so there's a limit to what this will guarantee mm -hmm. you, right? You can you can still test something uh, like if is it a list of, of int and under certain circumstances it'll certainly be a list but it not act, might not be a list not everything in it might really be an int because uh, you know I mm -hmm. could get into the scenarios where this can happen in practice this actually works for people and meets their expectations rather well and uh, the only worry I have about this casting is that it'll get overused because uh, 
people don't like to have type warnings, so they they might be tempted to use it to satisfy the type checker, and Dart is very much ag against this idea of having to battle the type checker. If you really care about that, yeah, the type annotations can be adjusted or something, but this thing actually has a runtime cost, it happens, and so you shouldn't use it for that. But uh, it's there. Um, again, people felt a need for this shorthand, and so, you know, we, we didn't think it was necessary in the beginning, and we added it. But, but ultimately, the type system it's nominal. So you, when you're doing like subtype checks and so on, that's a nominal check, or do it's, you have like structural? Well, so function types are essentially structural, <laughs> right? And there's a structural element to the generic types as well, yes. right? So it's but ge th those things tend to be that way even in in the strictest type systems, right? Uh, well, but it's it's always kind of subtle, right? Because for example, in Haskell, mm -hmm. you do have nominal and structural. Well, there's no subtyping, yeah. but type equivalents. But there, in the recurs in the recursive type, there always has to be a nominal type to kind of break the loop. So, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if right. your so, kind of function you know, yeah, types yeah. can be recursive. Can you define like you know x equals well, x arrow it, so x? So the or, nominal or, types yeah. are th do save you from yeah. getting going you know <laughs> nuts uh, for a long, long time. Uh, so yeah, it's primarily nominal, but there is a uh, structural. The other thing is, of course, they're very, very loose. Uh, the functional types are almost anything goes, really, because uh, the parameters have to be assignable, which means they're on an inheritance chain. But, but it doesn't matter on which side, so you can upcast or downcast on okay. them, and we don't complain. And, and same for the return type. And there, there are, because we have optional parameters, there are some more constraints, because we, we do want the arity to match up, unlike JavaScript, we don't want extra parameters floating mm -hmm. about or less parameters. We, if you have um, name parameters, we want the names to, to be there, things like that. Uh, so there are a bunch of, of slightly non-standard but fairly obvious constraints to make sure that, that these things can be called. Or so if you, if you um, insist on the, the right number of parameters, can you overload on, on, on method names or...? We, over, we, we don't Or overload. like overload on arity, sorry. Like we do not overload on arity. You basically have one method with this name, and it could have optional stuff and okay. so forth. But no, we don't do uh, arity-based overloading or any overloading. Yeah, because I think you know, like type-based overloading, and you, you've you've written yeah. the Java language yeah. spec. I mean, that is the kind of most hairy part of most language definitions. The great thing about type-based overloading is it gives employment to people like me. <laughs> uh, but other than that, it has no redeeming qualities. So yeah, uh, type-based overloading is overloading is truly evil. Arity-based overloading is actually pretty harmless. Yeah. It just you know doesn't really fit that well, and, and especially once you, if you do that, you really want to ensure that everything has required parameters because otherwise you're again up in in deep water because now you can't tell what what you're doing. And given that we have optional positional parameters now, which is just coming in. Uh, as well as uh, name, optional name parameters, you really don't want to get into the arity business as well. One of the reasons I think that people, where you have to use, well, at least in like Java or C Sharp, where you have to use type-based overloading is for constructors, because you know, there you cannot change the name. So if you want to have different constructors, you have no choice. Well, it turns out you do. Okay, uh, good, great. Right. So, so there's several choices. Of course, we're not trying to be in Dart. We're very conservative, so we do have constructors. The real good choices don't have, you know, just don't do it. You don't need constructors. You can just have regular, you know, methods on appropriate factory objects and so forth, uh, like we do say in Newspeak. But given that we wanted that familiar, warm, fuzzy feeling, which which people really appreciate about Dart, there are constructors. But we've fixed much of the things that are broken about constructors. So we have named constructors. So you can, you, if you have a class called okay. C, and the constructor, if, and you, you can have a constructor called C, but you can also have a constructor C.foo, and so you can then have additional constructors that are different. And this actually makes things both more readable and, and solves yeah. that particular problem. The constructors also in Dart solve other problems because we have factory constructors which don't really have to allocate an instance of that same class. They can huh. pick up things from a cache or call something else, Okay, so you, no dependency injection needed that's built in? Or you uh, can, to you, some extent, yeah. right, uh, depending how fancy you want to get, but it, it solves a lot of those yeah. scenarios, yeah. Yeah, because, so that's, now I can, uh, this just occurs to me, if you, if you get rid of interfaces, 
um, and can you still create an instance of an abstract class? Or like what, well, like... Oh, A, well, can, well, for, it depends what can means. Oh, yes. Oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> here, here's, we have the language lawyers. Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Shoot, may. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, um, basically, we, we uh, right now, we, we, we uh, because you mention a class name, in the, instances are created at bottom by new, but new can be, that new may not actually create a new thing, right? You can, uh, we also have these redirecting constructors, which lets you, you know, the thing can create something else, right? So the fact you say new C doesn't mean you have to get a C, right? So you can always fix it by, mm -hmm. by modifying that thing. Then that reduces the need for independency injection. Uh, and we, we, but we, uh, if it's an abstract class, uh, we won't, uh, we will warn you about that. And, uh, in fact, we'll, I think we'll, uh, we change it so we'll give you a runtime error if you try to instantiate it, unless it's one of these factories, because then, in fact, you, that's what happens when yes, how yeah. you use it as an interface. You call it, yes, it's yeah, an abstract yeah. class, and there's real implementation classes somewhere, which it, if you say new, foo, and foo is abstract, but if it's a factory, that's how the abstract class foo means to produce instances for yeah, you. Yeah. So it acts purely as an interface. So you refer to, which means that you can, you write your code referencing list or something. You don't have to pollute it with details of whatever mutable quantum mechanical list or whatever implementation. You, know, you can do that, but you can, you can avoid doing that. And uh, so, so most Dart users of a library really see the, the clean interfaces or the classes that define those interfaces now. So that's working rather well altogether. So, I mean, I... I'm I'm a fan of Dart. I can kind of, you know, be you know, that should be clear. But one one of the things that did disappoint me a little bit is that the the type system I think is super interesting. But the control flow is mm -hmm. a little bit like you, know, you said you didn't want to be adventurous. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the control flow is kind of boring. Yeah, and mm -hmm. especially yeah. if you, if you market it as a as a web programming language, there you would expect you know if I want to do asynchronous programming, for example. Then I'm still kind of thrown in the call, in callback hell. Uh, well, so you know, as I said, employment of programming language designers is an important topic, <laughs> and need, we need to have stuff to do <laughs> down the line. But seriously, we we have not yet really tackled that problem. Right? The the, the, the goal with the current mechanism was to put in the basics so that we'd have the plumbing on which higher level stuff could be put in. So it's very basic right now. Isolates have ports, and you can send to ports, and you can write, uh, you know, methods that therefore, you know, what you get back from these operations, it's asynchronous. So you get back futures. We have futures libraries and stuff, but there's nothing like uh, like async in C sharp or or promise pipeline or any of these yes, yeah. alternatives, right? And which alternative we'll go with, we will eventually go with something, I'm pretty sure, but we're not there yet. Uh, we're, we're putting in basic infrastructure. So at some point, this may change, and there's a whole bunch of ideas uh, ranging from C-sharp style async, which I have very mixed feelings about. I mean, it's obviously attractive, this illusion of sequential programming, but it's also, I think, a little dangerous. Uh, promise pipelining, Promise pipelining works better in, in even more dynamic settings because uh, control flow, uh, if control if control messages are actually method invocations, you can mm -hmm. you yes, can yeah. you can do better with promise pipelining. You can get past the ifs when, and things like that. Uh, so we haven't decided. I even have some some novel ideas of something that's not quite as radical as async, but in the direction which is basically based. Uh, I dare I say it? No, I I shouldn't say it. It's based on a, on a future monad, but uh, but uh, wow! It took almost <laughs> 25, 30 minutes to hear monad. But uh, <laughs> but of course, no one needs to know that. And in fact, the more I say it, the less likely ju just the mention yes, of exactly. the word. Yes, exactly. So is, now we've is, kind of killed the idea here. Yeah, you know, like uh, <laughs> beautiful flowers kind of you know, cut well, off I, at the roots. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's okay. Nobody will need to, you know, you don't need... The, the thing about monads, right, there are, it's an abstract concept. Yeah. 
Uh, maybe, maybe Eric knows of cases which I'm not aware of, but what is very hard to find is a case where, yeah, there's lots of examples. This is a monad, that's a monad. And what good did it do me to know this? Generally, as a user, it did me no good whatsoever, right? It's not like there are all these libraries that work on arbitrary monads that do interesting stuff. Maybe, maybe you know some in Haskell, but it's pretty rare as far as I can see that that you know, having say an interface mon the, the monad abstraction, the type class monad, something that works only on that, that does useful work. So it's so it's helpful to me that all these things were all defined as monads, and I can write this polymorphic code for all monads. I'm not sure that that really is there. I mean, I I I, I, I would disagree a yeah. little bit with that. I I think it's it's not super useful. There's not yeah. a lot of really generic code like that. But I think the problem is that most type systems are not able to express the, the monad interface yeah. because it's a higher kinded of, um, type. So mm -hmm. it, it's not it's a type that's not parameterized by a type, but mm -hmm. by a type constructor. Mm -hmm. And so most yeah. languages cannot express that. But in Haskell, there's various operators that, that are very useful that work on any monad. For example, you have a list of monadic computations and you want to turn that into a monadic computation of lists. So that's like a transpose mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. operator where you kind of, you know, you run the effects, um, you know, in the list and then mm -hmm. you, you accumulate the result and then the, the result mm -hmm. is an yeah. effectful computation. So there are definitely kind of higher level operations right. on monadic programs. And of course, the nice thing in a dynamic language, you can write that piece of code, which you you want to write, for example, for futures. That's a yes, very common exactly, scenario. Yes, yeah. uh, and you can write that without ever hearing of what a monad is, because all that op mattered is that you know about whatever you call them, chain, or whatever the names you attach to these things. Of course, the Haskell community, having a great imagination, came up with these bizarre and useless names, like <laughs> return and whatever. Bind and yeah, return. Yeah. Well, they're better than the category theory. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ada. Right, like, gag. Yeah. Oh, gag, bind, gag, I get confused. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, you, you, can write that, you can write that interface. It isn't statically typed, so it doesn't have to need, need to know that it's a higher order constructor, but it's just these operations and they will work, and that you can explain to anybody. On the other hand, you know, monads and category theory, you know, good luck with that. It, it, it just isn't um, a construct that I expect to see widely articulated. You just can't explain it to people. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. There are a few of those that actually would be useful, but if you get rid of the types, it all, all the complexity goes away. And, uh, and that's indeed the case with this particular use of, of composing futures to do a, a series of, of async operations, uh, which, again, is an idea that we might, you know, I have, I have this proposal, and as long as I don't say it's connected to monads, it might actually get in. Uh, but... Who knows? So, so what, what might help is that in, in C Sharp, tasks, which are like, yeah. you know, I um, hope that I don't step on anybody's mm -hmm. toes and, you know, insult people that they're kind of like futures. Mm -hmm. um, but tasks are actually co-monads. So maybe, you know, you, you can, instead of saying... That you makes it all better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes yeah. it all better, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why didn't you say so? I would embrace it in a moment, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the the thing is, and and so so, but maybe that that might be interesting because the 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 difference is in the way you compose them. So when you have a when you have a, a monad, when you have a computation, the monadic computation, then the continuation takes the result of the monadic computation. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of first run the 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 computation, and then you you can kind of you know, take the what it produced yeah. and continue. Um, with the co-monad with task, the continuation takes the task itself mm -hmm. and then it gets you know that when the task has terminated you can access it but mm -hmm. the task might have other contexts like whether it failed or succeeded mm -hmm. or so on so um, by not giving it the result of the computation but the kind of computation itself mm -hmm. you get a richer way of of, of composing okay mm -hmm. yeah you can, you can it, this is all so much easier without the types isn't it because then yeah. you can actually focus on what it does instead of uh, all this uh, yeah, continuations another good one. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, well, yeah, I, I've yeah, gotten I, so I, much I, trouble I, commenting I, on these things, right? I, I, it just seems to me that uh, there's a real gap between the theoretical practice, if you will, and the reality. And 
it's, it reaches a point where it's a problem, right? Uh, mathematics, classical, a lot of classical mathematics was derived hand in hand with physics. Even mathematicians yes, yeah. don't like to admit that these days that's, either. No, but right? that's true. Yep. And once you uh, allow this disconnect to form, you, you, you're liable to get in trouble. So I'm, I'm, I, I have been rather unpopular in certain cycles by, in, you know, criticizing the, to me, the excessive reliance on these, on these concepts and, and this terminology, right? Because mathematicians love to explain things backwards, right? Because it all fits so wonderfully. Of course, it fits because it was designed to fit, but they, that would be beneath them to, to generally comment on. And we really, you know, I, th I think this is a point where sometimes types are useful because they help understanding, they document what you're doing. In these scenarios, they are, they are making things harder for people to follow. Uh, there's a lot of intellectual baggage that you're forcing people to swallow that they're not ready to. And again, unless you see a real case where, where it really is directly applied, which there are very few, then you're better off not talking about it. It's like rope in a hanged man's house, right? Don't mention the monad and you'll be better off. So I, 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 I agree with you, but um, to a large extent, yeah. I think a, lo a lot of times people use types as like uh, some smoke curtain yeah. to kind of hide th their lack of understanding yeah. even. So it, it causes lack of understanding, yeah. but sometimes they also use it to hide their own lack of understanding. But in this case, right, like when you have a future, yeah. you have to be able to talk about the components of the future or, you know, what, what happens, you know, the thing that kind of, you know, yeah, who's Takes driving the, whom? Yeah, which yes, direction? So, so I, yes, and so how do you then express that? I mean, I use the word continuation um, in in the sense that yeah. you know this is the thing that consumes the result of the mm -hmm. future. But um, we we do have to have some terminology or, or not. I'm you not cannot call it thingy and and you'd be wingy. Be surprised or, how far you can go <laughs> that way. Uh, you know, you work in industry. You should have known by now that you know <laughs> thingy is the all-purpose uh, concept. But fair enough. Uh, all I'm saying is that uh, I think these terms are are overindulged in, and uh, yeah, we uh, the uh, what did you call it? The hype graph, right? Yeah, yeah, the hype I, curve. I, yeah. I, th I think some of this stuff is past its best by date. Uh, it it gets overemphasized and it's not helping. Yeah, so one of the things, like a few weeks ago, I, I um, had, was at the GoTo Nights in Chicago. There will be a GoTo in Chicago as well, and I think in April. And I was there with Rich Hickey, and he, we were talking about continuations. And, and you know, I, I, we mentioned continuations just now. What, and you reacted kind of, you know, what is, what, what's the thing with continuations? Why are they so hard? Um, I think, again, it's very similar to the Monad case. It's a mathemat mathematician's abstraction. It's not the, right, it's not the abstraction that, that programmers actually want or need, right? The abstraction that programmers really want or need and that they can relate to is something concrete like the collar or the stack. And sure, part of that isn't the continuation because part of it is past, and, but it's also your path to the, to the, the future. future. Yes. But it's something you can put your hands on it's something real that you can relate to, and it's something that you ha that is already divided into useful pieces. So you know, uh, if continuations aren't bad enough, we have delimited continuations where things really get interesting, and that is is something that's very hard for people to relate to. But on the other hand, you know, stack frames. Okay, I have my collar. It has a collar. I can go up three levels, five levels, twenty levels. I can always decide to stop when I'm at and I know what context I'm in and it has a name because it's associated with a method with something in my code it's not some some mathematical abstraction and a mirror you know a reflective system that lets you traffic in those is is really useful that's why for example squeak uh, small talk has a seaside framework for web programming that that did this continuation style web uh, interaction mm -hmm. without calling it that without anyone having to know that and it works perfectly, and they didn't need to add anything to the system to do it because it was all already there. But aren't we just now like um, bike shedding? I mean, it's like it, like whether you call it like f f stack mirrors or continuations, they are the same thing. That, that's uh, what a continuation is, right? It's, it's a first-class representation of your stack. Of well, your it, stack. In, in reality, it's always a delimited one because yeah. even the schemers stop it at the REPL or whatever, yes. right? It's it's never, you know... the and so it's, 
it's the delimited one you want, it's the fine grain control you want, and you might as well talk about that, uh, you know, rather than, than this strange idea of call CC, you know, this is not an intuitive notion. And I think but generally, mathemat let me say this this way, programming languages is, is, is derived from computer science in general, it's come out of mathematics. And so it has a certain cultural history, and, and it makes a lot of sense, because mathematics is how you actually figure things mm -hmm. out. But elements of programming languages that have to do with, you know, I'd say psychology, cognitive science, design, you know, things that speak mm -hmm. to people, uh, are, are woefully neglected. And we, we really should be focusing on this sort of UI of these things a lot more. So the fact that it's mathematically equivalent is irrelevant. This is a useful API that, that gives you the right structure, the right granularity that you can actually implement fairly easily. You can control its properties fairly easily. It doesn't have to be very expensive. You can control its security, all kinds of things like that. And so, you know, it's just, it's just a better way of actually engineering the thing. So, so uh, like, I think what you're saying is that if you look at like continuations say operationally they're not kind of that complicated um, one of the things that I often feel is the way people try to explain continuation say in scheme is because scheme is an expression based language that makes it I think harder because then it's much harder to kind of you know to talk about like a point in your mm -hmm. program where you know there's a stack frame or mm -hmm. where there's yeah. a call um, so but but I, I agree with you in some sense th these things are well, I wouldn't say that they're trivial, yeah. but you, you can make them harder by kind of you know, putting this kind of magical, mathematical uh, pixie dust uh, mm -hmm. on them. But it has huge advantages. It'll make you sound smarter. Um, and in some sense, I would say the same holds for type system. When people talk about co and contra variants, mm -hmm. um, I, I would bet that like 80% uh, of the people cannot explain what contra variants actually means or kind of, you know, give mm -hmm. a coherent explanation of that. Um, but still, you know, they like to throw the term around. Well, it's an interesting yeah. idea because that's, again, a perfect example where, where the mathematical truth conflicts with people's intuition. Mission, yes. And it's not that people's intuition is correct, but unfortunately that's what we have to work with. And so it's, it's a good idea not to rely too heavily on things that, that fly in the face of people's intuition. But do you think that there's no role at all for mathematical abstractions in programming? Oh, of course there is a, there's a huge role. The question is you, you have to know when to, to keep your mouth shut about them and when to stop taking them as religion, right? Uh, so I don't know how you feel about this, but a big thing in the functional programming language community is, you know, we have mathematical-like notation. This is one of the worst ideas ever. Um, mathematical notation doesn't scale. Mathematical notation works because, you know, people write little proofs by hand and we already violate a lot of conventions in mathematics. Things have single, you know, single uh, character identifiers basically, which are sort of designed to actually hide what they're doing so you don't let your intuition mislead you. Whereas once you scale it up to programming, it's important to have meaningful identifiers. Generally the whole notation you know, is not particularly well suited to this and it, it shouldn't be a goal to emulate it, right? It's again one of those cases where tradition and habit is for certain people overtaking it, but you know, it would be good to think about what notation really works for this stuff. But, but uh, So I, I'm a little bit like schizophrenic yeah, about yeah. that because on the one hand I do like, for, for example, uh, uh, Haskell, the kind of, you know, the very concise, clean mathematical yeah. notation. On the other hand, it also leads to excesses where people write things in point-free style where mm -hmm. it looks like token soup and you have no clue mm -hmm. what it means. On the other hand, if you look at most other programming languages, including Dart or Java or C-sharp, eh, curly braces and so on, it's not still not very human-friendly. So maybe, the, maybe COBOL kind of style or Visual Basic style syntax is that any better? Small, small talk has a similar it kind of... It took you that know. long to arrive at <laughs> the one true answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it, it is better, uh, arguably. I, what, what really happens is that people are creatures of habit and the familiar is always the best. So once, once people have been exposed to a certain notation at a certain age and gotten used to it, it's very hard to get them off of it. 
and they will invent all kinds of arguments why. But if you actually look at it systematically, there, there's real arguments for, for that kind of notation. And, uh, and I wish we, we, if, when we did speak about syntax, we focused yes. on those aspects. But usually it's either a matter of religion or, uh, or it's a matter of bike shedding where it's talking about that to avoid talking about things that are more. Oh, so, okay, so um, monads are over the hype curve. I think this is a perfect time to kind of, you know, <laughs> <laughs> throw to, me out to <laughs> throw the gilad out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before I say something that kind of I regret. So thank you very much, <laughs> gilad. It was like as always, like a great pleasure. Mm -hmm. and yeah, thank you so it was much. great being here. Thank you. Cheers.